So I wanted to talk about something that's uh, positively uncomfortable for most people, and that's, that's poverty. Um, but I want to do this, I want to be a little bit provocative, because we're likely to ignore these things that, that make us uncomfortable. And I would argue that if you really want to address issues of overfishing, like Jeremy's very convincingly uh, suggested that we need to, you're going to have to directly address poverty, poverty in, in, in much of the world in order to do that. So the overwhelming majority of coral reefs are located in developing countries where poverty is a persistent uh, 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 or a daily reality for many people. Now, poverty is a major driver of change on coral reefs because it shapes the priorities, the capacities, and the actions of both individuals and, and society at large. So efforts to conserve coral reefs in a poverty persistent context are likely to be ineffective and sometimes even counterproductive unless they can directly address the way that, that poverty shapes people's uh, interaction with the reef. So my talk today is going to highlight some of the ways that poverty is related to, uh, to, to reefs and highlight some of the emerging literature on that. And there'll be three key parts to it. First, I'll talk about how poverty affects behavior in ways that negatively impact reefs. Second, I'll talk about some of the pathways out of poverty. But to do this, I'll actually have to draw largely from the agricultural economics literature because there's been a surprising dearth of, uh, of this in fisheries and particularly in coral reefs. And then I'll talk about the effectiveness of programs that have tried to integrate conservation and development and how effective they've been over time at reducing key dimensions of poverty. So poverty can clearly influence the types of fishing practices that people engage in. And for example, in East Africa, where I, I spend a lot of time working, uh, one of the most destructive gears that are used are, are seine nets. And not only does their small uh, uh, mesh size capture a high proportion of, of juvenile fish, but in certain ways that they're used, particularly when they're used as, as sort of mini per seine nets, they're used directly on reefs and they can be highly destructive to the reef habitat architecture because people go in and literally uh, use crowbars and, and sticks to drive the fish into the nets there. So it can be very, very destructive to the, the corals uh, themselves. Well, in a survey of Kenyan and Tanzanian fishermen, I found that poorer fishers were much more likely to use this destructive seine net gears. And in fact, I could predict with 70% accuracy whether somebody used destructive gears based solely on an index of their household wealth, which is a sort of multivariate index called a material style of life, which is based on the presence or absence of things like uh, TV, electricity, and the types of, of roof, floors, and, and, and walls that people have. Poverty can also trap people into situations in which they overfish. And uh, I'll just highlight briefly a study I did of, uh, of Kenyan fishermen where we ran scenarios about how they would respond to declines in their fish yields. And you can see the probability of a fisherman saying that he would exit the fishery, which is on the y-axis there. We tried to predict that with a range of socioeconomic characteristics. And the two that really stood out were the number of occupations available in that household. That's on the, the x-axis there. But more interestingly, I think, was the level of poverty uh, in, in the households. And we can see um, the, the lowest, middle, and upper uh, uh, thirds of, of, of poverty there really dramatically influence it. In fact, the poorer, uh, particularly the lower uh, household occupational levels, are three times less likely to feel like they could get out of fishing when the fishery has collapsed. So poverty is actually going to keep people into situations where they're overfishing, which can then reinforce poverty. Of course, the real dramas emerge when uh, the socioeconomic conditions like poverty interact with ecological dynamics to create sort of negative feedback loops and drive the system towards undesirable states. And you can see this heuristic here highlights how poverty is related to overfishing and destructive gear use, uh, which can then um, affect key ecosystem functions such as herbivory, creating a negative feedback loop that drives the system towards one dominated by algal slime instead of corals, which can then, of course, feed back to society, providing fewer ecosystem goods and services to society and eventually reinforcing poverty. So how then can we break these uh, sort of negative feedback loops? Well, often the solutions have been these sort of uh, technical supply side solutions focused on fixing the fishery. These efforts are, are laudable and, and, and needed, but often highly ineffective for a couple of key reasons. And the first is that they actually 
often mix up the problems and the symptoms, and they misplace the locus of poverty, assuming that it's because of the fishery that people are poor, right? And it assumes that improvements in, in the environment will actually reduce poverty. Well, sometimes that may be the case, but often chronic poverty is intertwined with resource degradation, but it's actually exogenous to it, right? It's exogenous to the system. It's related to macroeconomic or social structural issues, right? Things like caste systems can ensure that people don't get provided with opportunities to advance up the socioeconomic ladder. So in these situations, trying to solve people's poverty through the fishery is unrealistic. It's not going to address the structural issues which are keeping people in poverty. Now, secondly, these efforts often fail to consider how different groups uh, of actors in, in society can access resources. It doesn't account for things like power dynamics and institutional access, access mechanisms which create winners and losers in society. And we often see it's actually the poor that bear the heavier burden of conservation efforts. And I'd just like to present a quick vignette of this from a, a forthcoming paper uh, in Society and Natural Resources. And in the study of Kenyan fishermen, we were actually examining spatial behavior of fishermen in and around marine reserves. And just a quick question we asked them was whether they used to fish in, as a primary fishing ground, the area that is now a marine reserve. And there was a high proportion of fishers that did used to fish in this area, about 70%. But we then tried to see whether we could predict whether somebody had been displaced from, uh, from the reserve based on their socioeconomic characteristics. Was it differentially affecting some fishers versus others? And we found that the displaced fishers were, were poorer. And this was based, again, on this material style of life index, but also their levels of expenditures, right? Their fortnightly expenditures. So conservation was having a disproportionate impact on the poorer people. The assumption here is that they had lower spatial mobility, that they, because they were poor, they weren't able to have boats and get further, go for, uh, fishing further afield. So you can see I'm a little bit skeptical of trying to solve poverty issues through the fishery, but I'm also actually a little bit skeptical of trying to solve fishery issues through poverty reduction. And this has to do with the mechanisms through which people, households, get into and out of poverty. And I want to review some literature on this briefly, but it's going to come from agricultural economics because they've done the best research to date tracking households through time, looking at uh, how households go above and below poverty thresholds over time. And I'm just going to review three key studies here. And one comes from post-apartheid South Africa, where over five years, 25% of surveyed households fell below a defined poverty threshold, while only 10% of households moved above that threshold. In Western Kenya, 19% of households moved above a poverty threshold, but the same percentage fell below that, that same poverty threshold. And across 36 villages in Indonesia, 14% of households climbed above this poverty threshold, but 12% fell below. Now, these studies on poverty dynamics are actually really important for two key reasons. First is it highlights a really important scale issue here. Right? And so particularly with these last two studies, if you were to study the system over time and just you know, look at a snapshot of these communities over time, you would actually say that poverty is a pretty steady state and that, uh, that poverty seems to be quite consistent over time because the same proportion of people are, are trapped in poverty. But what we're really seeing is even though the system itself seems quite stable, the individual components are not. That there's a high degree of turnover of the actual households that are in poverty. And that's actually important because it raises the issue is, what is the mechanism of escape for people? And does that mechanism of escaping from poverty, right, does climbing out of poverty for some households actually entrench others into poverty, right? So what I want to do briefly is review the reasons why these households were able to, to fall into poverty and how they were able to emerge out of poverty as well. So most often the reasons that households fell into poverty was related to things like health issues, right? Sp sporadic high expenses, large family sizes, small land holdings, right? This is the limited resources that they had available to them. Personal debts caused by high interest loans, death of a, a highly productive household member, uh, and environmental conditions such as drought and fire. And in a fisheries context, this might be more like a, a coral bleaching event or indeed a cyclone, as Gary's just pointed out. 
I think more interestingly, though, is how do households climb out of poverty? How do they get out? What were the conditions that allowed these, you know, 25% or 20% or 14% of households to escape this, this, this poverty trap? And it had to do with three key reasons. And the first was an accumulation of productive assets. The second were land improvements, things like irrigation systems that allowed them to get more productivity per hectare of their land. And the third was diversification of livelihoods. Now, these are important because I think when we look at these in a fisheries context, there's some problems with them, right? In an agricultural system, right, enhancing uh, or investing in productive or structural assets can be compatible with environmental conservation. In some cases, it may even enhance biodiversity. But in wild capture fisheries context, right, productive assets typically involve uh, intensification of overexploitation, right? This involves things like buying more traps, buying more nets, buying bigger boats, or maybe buying a second boat and employing people to go fishing more. Now, the second idea of land improvements, I think is problematic in a reef fisheries context, because in, in a wild capture fisheries, there isn't really an analog to this. You can't necessarily get more productivity out of it by putting fertilizer on a reef. In fact, we'd probably argue you'd get a lot less, right? There isn't really an analog to this. I think reef restoration at an ecologically meaningful scale is, is impractical. Um, I'd argue that you could have improvements in value, right? You can value add products, but that creates different types of market incentives, which may be more problematic. That may actually amplify resource abuse as well. Well, the last one, which is more of an amplif or, sorry, more of a dampening uh, response, potentially, is lower dependence on resources, is diversifying livelihoods. I'm a little bit hesitant on this for a, a couple of key reasons, and that's because most alternative livelihood projects for fishermen have been spectacularly unsuccessful, in part because they don't reflect the the reasons that people fish. There's a lot of non-economic satisfactions that fishermen get from fishing. Let's face it, fishing's pretty awesome. It's dangerous, you get to go out and kill things. People like it. It's much more interesting than working for someone as a tourism guide or something like that. People, a lot of fishermen love fishing. So this idea of alternative livelihoods, is, 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 it been, it's proven difficult. The second thing though comes from, the second cautionary bit of this has to do with the ways that resources are managed in many places, right? And decades of research in common property, uh, or common property research has shown that people are unwilling to invest in a resource. This is investing their time or uh, complying with resource management regulations voluntarily if their livelihood doesn't depend on it. People are only willing to invest in things if it's important to them. And by reducing people's level of dependence on resources, you can actually create disincentives for them to comply with resource management initiatives when it's done on their own accord. So as we see, there's a lot of co-management initiatives happening in reef fisheries contexts. And if your governance framework is one that relies a lot on voluntary uh, compliance and voluntary effort, Reducing dependence on resources may actually create disincentive for people to comply with that. So the key point here is that the traditional pathways out of poverty may, in a fisheries context, actually amplify resource abuse and further entrench others in poverty, creating poverty trap dynamics at multiple scales. So I've been a bit skeptical of trying to solve fisheries issues through poverty reduction and trying to solve poverty through fisheries. But I do think there's scope for integrated approaches that do both, that deal with uh, species management, that deal with institutional strengthening, and that deal with poverty reduction. Now, these sort of integrated conservation and development projects were, they were sort of all the rage in the late 80s through the 90s and the, the early 2000s. They've fallen a little bit out of fashion now because we're, we like property rights and ecosystem-based management, but there was a big push for these. And one of the most disappointing things from a scientist, scientific point of view is the lack of evidence in whether these things worked or not. And there's been literally hundreds of millions of dollars put into these, and we virtually have no idea whether they work over time. There's just been a lack of basic ideas of doing things like before, after, control, experiment at multiple points in time. So with that, 
I'd like to uh, highlight a paper that it's just online early, and it's co-authored by, or sorry, it's led by one of the, the uh, one of the students that I co-supervised, Georgina Gurney. And I think she's done the most standout job to date of really looking at these and, and, and critically evaluating these integrated conservation and development projects using the, the, the evaluation tools we as scientists know you should, which is looking at something before it happens, using a control, and looking at it over time. Now, Georgina studied four integrated conservation and development projects and four control villages in Indonesia. The project villages had developed marine protected areas, they developed management plans for the broader fishery, uh, and there was development activities. These development activities included things like improved access to drinking water, livelihood training, revolving funds, and environmental education. We looked at these before, three, five, and 15 years after implementation using the same set of indicators. This relied on uh, surveying over 2,000 household surveys plus key informant interviews to examine whether poverty was reduced over time in project versus control villages. One of the key things I want to point out, though, is a lot of people think about poverty as being a lack of financial capital. But social scientists have a much broader vision of what poverty is, right? It's much more, we consider it much more multidimensional than that. And this is the sort of World Bank framework for poverty reduction, which looks at reducing elements or, or improving elements of poverty, uh, sorry, empowerment, opportunity, and security. Now, in this paper, we operationalized indicators in each of these domains. In the interest of time today, I'm just going to present uh, four indicators. Uh, from two of the domains, livelihood diversity, fisheries dependence, environmental knowledge, and material wealth. So you can see those indicators on the left there, and we're going to look at effect sizes, uh, so effect sizes, so changes over time relative to baseline conditions, right? So we've got the control villages uh, that are open circles and the project villages that are the closed circles. So between 1997 and 2000, there was no real change in livelihood diversity for control villages, sorry, for project villages, but control villages reduced. 1997 to 2000, there were substantial changes in control villages, but again, project villages remained the same. Between 1997 and 2012, there was lower diversity in both project and control villages, but it was much lower in the project, uh, in, in the control villages, right? So livelihood diversity was actually higher because of the projects. So overall, livelihoods were less diverse over time, but there was high, higher livelihood diversity in the project villages. When we look at fisheries dependence, there was significantly less dependence on fisheries after the project implementation, which was not apparent for the control villages. In fact, Project Village's households were 80% more likely to undertake an activity other than fishing as a primary, primary livelihood activity in 2002 relative to 1997. So these changes are very substantial. There was a shift towards higher dependence after project completion, but Project Village's were still lower. Again, when we look at environmental knowledge, it was, became higher in project villages between 1990, 1997 and 2000. Uh, this increased again uh, between 1997 and 2002. Now, interestingly, post-evaluation, both project and control villages had major increases in environmental awareness, right? But the project villages were still a bit higher. This may have reflected larger, you know, provincial scale or national scale environmental awareness issues. Now, let's look at the last one, wealth. There was significantly higher wealth in project villages. Uh, and this increased over time in the controls, right? But it remained higher in the project villages. So does integrated conservation and development work? Well, I showed it contributed to poverty, poverty alleviation across the four dimensions shown. There were some other variables. I didn't have time to go into all the complexities. Some were a, le a little bit less clear cut than that. It did seem to provide a short-term boost. But these improvements occurred mostly during the implementation period and didn't continue to accumulate faster than the controls after the, the, the project completion. There was also a tendency to creep back towards baseline conditions after the project, right? So this was particularly important for dependence and for wealth. Uh, 
So my last slide, I just want to sort of end with some, some of the key questions that, I, that this sort of study ended up with me thinking about for, for uh, poverty and reefs. And this is key, really. What are transitions out of poverty like, particularly in mixed fishing and farming communities? We tend to think about fishing communities, but in my experience, having been to about 150 coastal communities around the world, I've never seen one, right? All the communities I go to mix agriculture and fisheries, right? So what is it like escaping poverty? And are there, is there a capacity for an individual household to have an amplifying strategy in one domain, in agriculture, but a dampening strategy in the other domain? Or do people simply employ one type of strategy as a household? I'm interested in these scale issues. How might escaping poverty trap by some further entrench others? And lastly, do the characteristics of fishers, things like lifestyle, identity, pride, enjoyment, and the system properties of fisheries, right? One of the interesting and important things about fisheries from poor people's point of view is that there's an opportunity for a windfall of money. You can go out and get a big catch. And that opportunity for a windfall is not available for many poor people in most other occupations. So do the characteristics of fishers and fisheries ameliorate or reinforce poverty traps? So with that, I'd just like to say thanks very much.